glad each of you are here today. We'd like to begin with a special time for our kids. The church, help me sing our children down. Jesus loves me, this I know. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me when I'm good and I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, but it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care what the devil's going to do because the word of faith is my sword and shield. Jesus is the Lord of the way I feel. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care what the devil's going to do because the word of faith is my sword and shield. And Jesus is the Lord of the way I feel. You know, Jesus is the Lord of the way I feel. Oh, it's good to see you today. By the way, did y'all ever get tired? You got so much energy. Do, how many of you love to take naps? Really? That many? Yeah. Naps are, can be very, very enjoyable because we get tired at times. And a good nap helps us to rest. But a lot of times, people your age don't like to take naps. Instead, you want to keep on playing, keep on doing the things that you want to do, or keep on watching that show. But sometimes we get tired, and we have to rest. But I know something we should never get tired of doing. We should never get tired of doing what God wants. In fact, if we try and do what God wants all the time, God gives us the strength and the energy to keep doing it. We never have to take a break. We never have to take a rest from doing what God wants. And if we do what God wants, you just wait and see how God helps us and gives us energy. We can be like the people that are talked about in Isaiah 40, 31. But the people who trust the Lord will become strong again. They will be able to rise up as an eagle in the sky. They will run without needing rest. They will walk without becoming tired. God always helps us to do what he wants us to do. Isn't that nice to know? We're so excited you're here today. People behind me, they're pretty pumped to see you too. Give them a big wave and a smile. And don't forget to wave high up top and to our youth group. We're thrilled you're here. Let's go back and sit with our family and friends and we'll sing about how good God is. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Good morning. It's good to see you. Welcome to the Edmund Church of Christ. We want to welcome everyone, members of this church, and of course, our guest today. Whatever brings you our way, we are thankful that you are here. Maybe you're visiting family for Thanksgiving. Maybe you're new to the community. Whatever brings you our way, we are pleased to welcome you. Let's put the QR code up on the screen. If you don't mind, check in. If you're a member of this church, if you're a guest, please just take a moment to check in and let us know that you're participating in worship, whether you're in person or online. We welcome everyone online. Just take out your phone, open your camera app, hold it up there to that code. It'll give you a link. Click on that link. Answer a couple of quick questions. You know how to use a QR code. But if you don't, just go by the Welcome Center, and Kevin will help you out. He, he can sign you in as well. This QR code will also be on the screen at the end of our service today. Speaking of Kevin at the Welcome Center, if you are a first-time guest, please go by and see Kevin. He has a special gift for you, especially if you're new to the community, if you're looking for a church home, if you want information about the Edmund Church of Christ, we would love to visit with you. If you got in here without a communion packet, we're going to need those for communion in a few minutes. Just raise your hand. We have some guys who can make sure you get one of those. Just keep your hand up until they see you. They'll be glad to give you a communion packet if you need one of those. Appreciate you guys doing that. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It's, uh, it's, it's odd to think that it's already almost December, 
and we're in the holiday season. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving. Is it, uh, is it tryptophan that's in the turkey that makes you sleepy? I hope that's all out of your system this morning. I got to tell you, first service, I think some of them had turkey for breakfast. I'm not sure. <laughs> Hopefully that's all out of your system. Kent was talking to the kids about taking naps. Don't take a nap during the sermon today, okay? Wait till later this afternoon. We have a lot going on here at the Edmund Church of Christ, and one of those things is a men's retreat coming up this weekend. There's a couple of typos on dates. It says November at a couple of places. It's December, of course, this weekend. So, fellas, we would love for you to sign up to be a part of that great event this weekend, Friday night and Saturday morning, and more will be said about that later. Well, this is our time to come together and worship together. What a great opportunity we have. You know, many people have been thinking about and talking about being thankful. Maybe at your table, you went around the table and had everyone share something they're thankful for. And I think that's good. That's, that's helpful. But of course, as people who are followers of Jesus, people that have so much to be thankful for, our, our thanksgiving is not just one time a year. It is a lifestyle. It is a way of life. Uh, this attitude of gratitude, as people say. And I think there's something to that. This mindset that says we are so blessed by God in so many ways, and not just physical blessings, but the spiritual blessings that God gives us. And the fact that he gives us peace when there is so much chaos and conflict in our world. The fact that he provides hope for us, that, that this isn't it, that there is something beyond the struggles of this broken world. The fact that he forgives our sins through Jesus and gives us salvation with him for all of eternity. All of those spiritual blessings that we have, the peace, the hope, the joy, the love that we get to experience, we should be thankful, most thankful. And today as we worship, we have an opportunity to express gratitude and thanksgiving to God. We do that in other ways as we live out our lives, but today as a community of faith, we come together to express to God how grateful we are as we acknowledge that he is the one and only God. We worship him and we remember his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, let me just encourage you to worship with all of your heart, to be fully present in our time together, to sing with your heart and your voice, to open up your ears to the word of God, to give sacrificially, to remember Jesus as we commune together. Let's worship today. If you don't mind, as we begin, let's stand together. We're going to read out loud from God's word, Psalm 44, verse 8. Let's read this out loud as we begin our time of worship together. In God we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Oh, 
praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Please be seated. We bow now. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for this time to be able to come here together as a congregation to worship you, to praise you, to learn more about you. Father, and just be thankful for you. Father, you continue to do so much for this nation and so much for this land and for this people. Father, you protect us. Father, you help us to flourish. Father, you have healed us and you have continued to keep us safe during this pandemic. Father, we are thankful for the ways that you have brought peace to this world. But Father, we know that there are people that are still hurting even in, in times of stress. Places like Ukraine and Taiwan that are struggling. Father, we ask that your hand would be ever present and the good things may happen because of this conflict. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless this church. As we close out this year, and we make great plans for the future. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless this eldership and, this, and the deaconship and those that are working as ministers with this church. Give them peace, give them wisdom, give them insight, Father, and give them strength. They do so much for us, Father, we ask that you would bless their lives greatly. Father, as we studied about the blind man today and it, the way he was healed and the way that he believed, Father, help us to always be willing to step out, to be bold and courageous and to state the things that we know that are true, that you are the Lord and Savior of us all. That you created this planet, that you created us, and that only through you may we find salvation. Father, it's such an, an amazing gift that you would give your one and only Son that we might be healed, that we might re be redeemed. Father, we can't thank you enough. Father, we, we try and we know that we, we stumble, we know that we sin. Father, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would restore us, that you would give us strength and that you would encourage us to get back up and to continue to carry your cross for you. Father, we ask that you would be with us today as we continue this service. Help the singing to be a joyful noise. Help our thoughts and our prayers to be a pleasing aroma to you. Father, bless us this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, Sometimes 
The chief reason that we give thanks the first day of the week is the cross where Jesus became the Lamb of God that we just sang about. Today Randy is going to talk to us about Jesus appearing to the disciples after the resurrection and addressing their doubt, and that's a great theme 
that will follow right after the Lord's Supper. This morning, I want us to think a little bit about a passage that we used in last week's sermon from the Psalms as we focus now on the Lord's Supper and thinking about the cross. We're almost all familiar with the 23rd Psalm, what many would call a great poem of the Old Testament, but it often overshadows the uh, chapter right before it that I would argue is more powerful. Um, <clears throat> I want to read some passages from Psalm 22 as we think about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In verse 1 of Psalm 22, um, Jesus cited it on the cross in Luke 16 and Matthew 27, 46. And according to Jewish tradition, Esther referenced this when she first went to plead with the king to save the Jews. Matthew 27, 46 has Jesus quoting, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want to read 22, Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. I want to move to verses 6 through 8 in chapter 22. Jesus' mocking by the people was prophesied here and described in Matthew 27, 48 through 49. Verse 6 in Psalm 22, But I am a worm and not a man, a scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their, he their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I want to move to verses 12 through 18 in Psalm 22 as we think about the cross. In verse 14, we have a reference in Job chapter 3 as well. My groanings are poured out like water. Verse 15 prophesies Jesus' thirst from John 19, 28 when he said, I thirst. In verses 16 through 17 prophesied Jesus' death on the cross by the Romans before there ever was a Roman Empire. And it was not the more common stoning of Jews. So a condemned to that death sentence with no broken bones did not make sense to Jewish people for most of their history. In verse 18 prophesies that the soldiers would cast lots for Jesus' clothes in Matthew 27, 35 and Luke 23, 34. I want to read Psalm 22, 12 through 18. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast, my strength is dried up like a pot sherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, if we move to the last few verses of Psalm 22, 29 through 31, that ends in triumph and a call to celebrate and proclaim, especially to the next generation, which is what we do with the Lord's Supper each first day of the week as well. Verse 29 of Psalm 22. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. In Acts 20 and verse 7, we see from the writings of Luke that on the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, seeming to show a practice of meeting to celebrate the Lord's Supper on the first day. 1 Corinthians 11:26 tells us, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we do this morning, this first day of the week at the Edmund Church of Christ. Let us pray now as we think about the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all our blessings. We thank you this first day of the week as we come to celebrate the cross, the sacrifice, the pain, the torture, and the resurrection of your son Jesus. Help us, Father, now as we focus on the bread, to think about the breaking of his body, though no bones were broken. He was put through immense pain to pay the price of our sins. We thank you for that sacrifice. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let us once again pray for the fruit juice. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, this grape juice that we're about to take that once again represents a symbol, this being the symbol of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. You've told us there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, <clears throat> and his blood was innocent, and we were guilty. Father, we thank you for that shed blood and that cleansing blood. We ask that you help us to turn from ways of sin and to live lives that are worthy and honorable of the sacrifice of this blood of Jesus. It's his name that we pray this prayer. Amen. I reference 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 about as often as we take the communion that it proclaims the Lord's death until he comes. In 1 Corinthians 16, we also have the writings from Paul in verse 2 where he says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to set something aside. And the purpose of that was to give back to God to help those in need. Uh, this morning, we also uh, take this time to consider giving back to God. Uh, we have ways to do that online or boxes out, out in the foyer. And we ask that you uh, examine your heart and think about the ways you have been blessed before we give back this first day of the week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways you've blessed us. You've especially blessed each person in this room right now. We thank you, Father, for this building. We thank you for the resources and the leadership. We thank you for homes and clothes and food and freedom. Father, we ask that you help us to use these blessings to bring glory to you, to come closer to you, but not have distance between us and you. Help us to use these things and not these things to use us. Father, we ask that you help us to give back, to think about the ways we can give back. And then we ask a blessing on these gifts that they further the borders of your kingdom. In your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be This morning's scripture is from Luke 24, 36 through 40. 
While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do you, why do you have doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. We want to remind you that there is no Bible hour this morning, so all being here together, uh, would you please stand while we sing this song? Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation. spark conversation and stimulate learning. When we ask, we learn. Jesus asked many questions during his ministry, but most of Jesus' questions were not asked to learn something he didn't already know. His questions were usually asked to teach us something we need to know. What can we learn from questions Jesus asked? We're going to be in Luke 24 today. If you want to open your Bibles there to Luke chapter 24. Luke, of course, is in the New Testament, and in the, one of the Gospels there in the New Testament, if you're somewhat new to the Bible, it's right up front in your New Testament, Luke chapter 24. People have said that we are living in the age of skepticism, and if you are doubtful of that, then you uh, become a data point <laughs> supporting that notion that we are all questioning everything, and that we are doubtful of many things, and that we are all skeptics. Gallup did some research. They asked Americans over five decades about their level of confidence in some of the traditional institutions in our country, organized religion, government, big businesses, banks, healthcare industry. And what they found may not surprise you that there was a steady and often a very significant decline in confidence in these traditional institutions among most Americans. We just aren't sure who to trust. We aren't sure what to believe. 
And we could probably all speculate and even give very valid reasons for the skepticism that we experience and, let's be honest, contribute to quite often. We could come up with things like, well, there's so much information at our fingertips right now. With the internet, with 24-7 news cycle, with social media, there's just so much information. And with all of that information also comes what? Misinformation. And when you have information and misinformation, you don't necessarily always know what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false, what is real, what is fake. You don't know who to trust. And so you become skeptical. You become almost cynical sometimes. It is a challenge. And of course, with more transparency and with less discretion, with cameras and microphones everywhere, with fact-finding and fact-checking, with all of that, now we are at a different level of knowledge, aren't we? Because I think before, many times, we just sort of took things at face value. If somebody said something, we just assumed it was true. If we read something, we assumed it was true. But now we get to see behind the curtain, don't we? Now we get to see things that are exposed and that are put out for us to really go through with a fine-tooth comb. And that's not all bad if our goal is to find truth. I uh, saw an article recently about the McRib sandwich at McDonald's. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have had a McRib sandwich in the last few months. I have not, I am thankful to say. No judgment if you have. I've heard that it's for a limited time, but I've heard that Limited time means it keeps coming back. We can't get rid of the McRib sandwich. It's called the McRib, but McDonald's has admitted that it's really pork shoulder meat, not so much rib meat. You know, that's not a huge deal, right? The shoulder is close to the rib. But this article exposes the truth, if, of course, this article is true. And this article says that actually... If you're a McRib fan, you might want to plug your ears for the next couple of minutes. Actually, there are over 70 ingredients in that sandwich. 70 ingredients, and many of them are food additives that are used in non-dietary products, things that you would not eat. And the meat in the McRib, it is structured meat product. That's what the words were, structured meat product from parts like the heart and tripe and whatever scalded stomach is. <laughs> now, can you go imagine going up to the counter at McDonald's and ordering a McTripe sandwich? A Mc scalded stomach sandwich? It just doesn't have the ring to it, does it? So they called it the McRib. You know, the more information we get, the more skeptical we become. The more we see behind the curtain, the more we see how the sausage is made or how the McRib is made, <laughs> the more doubtful we become and the more cynical we become. That's the nature of information. It, it, it exposes and oftentimes it produces skepticism. But isn't it also true that information can do the opposite? Not only can information expose and cause us to doubt, but really information can confirm what is true. And it can actually make us feel stronger about our belief. It's that old saying that seeing is believing. But let's think about faith in God, faith in the word of God. Is seeing believing when it comes to God, when it comes to faith? Now the writer of Hebrews tells us a definition of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of, you know the rest of it, what we cannot see. How can you be certain about something you can't see? If seeing is believing and you can't see it, how can you believe in it? That's a fair question. And that's one of the, uh, the entanglements of doubt and of skepticism. And certainly, it gets us trapped sometimes. And so the question remains, does more information cause us to be skeptical or does it cause us to remove doubt 
when it comes to our belief in God? I want you to think about that question over the next few minutes as we look at this text in Luke chapter 24. You see, Jesus' disciples, they needed to see. For them, seeing was believing, or at least the first step in believing. And that is what a skeptic wants. Show me. Show me. Prove it. I need to see evidence. And that's what his disciples needed. And I want you to see what Jesus does with their doubts. And then I also want you to think about what Jesus does with our doubts. You see, when Jesus was alive, he told them that he was going to die. And he told them that he would be raised back to life. And when it actually happened, many of them either forgot that he had said that, or they just could not get their minds around something so far-fetched as Jesus being resurrected. He was resurrected, and he appeared to many people. And as he appeared to many people, they still had questions. Many of them did. That's what our disciples are dealing with now. Jesus is resurrected in some type of body that is different from his former body, and yet is not a spirit only. It's not a ghost. It's not something that just sort of floats around the room. It is material. Paul writes about the resurrected body in 1 Corinthians 15, this imperishable body. It is raised imperishable. And Jesus is in this bodily form, this imperishable body that has some kind of material structure to it. And the disciples who are witnessing him, they don't know what to do with that. It's probably unlike anything they have seen before. And even though Jesus said it was going to happen, and even though he's standing right in front of them, they struggle to believe. Look at our text, chapter 24 of Luke, verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. The resurrected Jesus stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. This is this greeting of comfort and peace. He also knows who he's talking to and what's going on with them. They are not at peace. Peace be with you, verse 37. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Now, we want to look at what Jesus does with their doubts and what he will do with our doubts. And I guess really what we should say is what we should do with our doubts. But look at his question. What is Jesus' question? Why do doubts rise in your minds? The disciples are afraid. They're confused. They're troubled. They have more questions than answers. Last they saw Jesus, he was being dragged away. He was being arrested. He was being tortured, ultimately being crucified by Roman officials. Three days later, they're hearing reports that he is back, that somehow he is alive again, and they're trying to understand that. They are skeptics. Could this be possible? How could this be possible? They don't know what to believe. And before we look at what Jesus does with their doubts, I want us just to sit in the tension of doubt for a moment. Because there is a lot of tension and doubt, isn't there? When someone says to you, especially someone you love, parents, when your kids or grandparents, when your grandchildren say to you, I'm really having doubts about my faith, what is your first reaction? There's all kinds of tension. It is panic. It is, oh no. It is, we've got to convince you otherwise. Or it's just overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that you just hope they will forget it and move on. Let's just dismiss these doubts. There is tension in doubt. And for a moment, I just want us to sit with these disciples who are startled and confused. They are filled with doubt. Because I think we can relate. Do you ever doubt? Do you ever have doubts about God? Do you ever have doubts about your faith? Do you ever have doubts about what you read in the Bible? See, already, just me asking that question, some of us are getting really uncomfortable. There's tension there. Well, if you have ever had doubts, if you have doubts right now, if you're going through a season of doubt, you're not alone. There are about two-thirds of people who claim to be Christians who say they have had or currently have major doubts about their faith. 
So first of all, you need to know you're not alone. You're not weird, you're not strange. It's somewhat normal. But I want us to go back, as you think about your doubts, maybe it was back when you were younger, maybe it's right now, maybe it's someone that is in your family and you've been talking to and you don't know what to say. I want us to go back to Jesus' question. Why do doubts rise in your minds? What is he saying? In essence, he's saying, where do these doubts come from? Remember what we said earlier, sometimes when we have more information, when we see things and hear things and read things and experience things, the more skeptical we become. So what are we seeing and hearing from our world? What are we exposed to? What are the messages that are coming our way about the Bible, about Christianity, about the church, about God? So much of what we hear is telling us we should be skeptical. We should doubt. That we should be cynical. Best-selling authors are writing books saying that anyone who has faith in Jesus is delusional. Social media often portrays Christians as heartless and bitter and bigoted. And then sometimes people who claim to be Christians act in ways that show that they are bitter and heartless and bigoted. And that impacts our faith, doesn't it? So-called experts in science or history, they hold up the Bible and they say, those stories that you're reading in the Bible, those are nothing more than a myth. Popular art and music. They say things like, self-expression is the highest goal of life. Self-value, self-fulfillment. And that truth is relative. And then someone that used to be a Christian, someone leaves the church. They deconstruct their faith. And they use that process of deconstruction as a platform to put the church on blast. And when we hear things like that, we either get defensive or we start to listen and say, you know, there may be something to that. And maybe we begin to dismantle our own faith. And then you add on top of all of those messages, all of those forces at work, you add what's going on in our hearts and our minds as we experience hardship and suffering, as we pray and look around and don't feel the effects of answered prayer, as we read in our Bibles about righteous people praying and getting what they ask for, and we feel like we are righteous and we recruit other righteous people and we pray and yet it doesn't feel like we're getting what we ask for. And we look around our world and we see so much injustice, so much suffering and war and violence and we wonder and we ask and we scratch our heads and we just can't quite get our minds around it all. You see, there are many reasons to be skeptical, to not believe. And after Jesus' resurrection, for the people there, there were many reasons for them to be skeptical. There were many reasons for them not to believe. You see, they believed in a Messiah that was coming. They had been waiting on this Messiah, who was coming to deliver the, the covenant people of God out from under Roman oppression. And now this Messiah has been killed at the hands of the Roman oppressors. You see, they had reason to doubt. The followers of Jesus, this Messiah, should grow and become this force to be reckoned with. And what has happened? What has happened recently? Well, people are leaving Jesus. They're running away from Jesus. They're jumping off the bandwagon. They had reasons to doubt. And now some are saying to them that Jesus is back. How's that possible? People don't die, get buried in a tomb, and then walk out of that tomb three days later. It just doesn't happen. It defies all laws of nature and science. You see, even back then, they had many reasons not to believe. Human logic, basic science, the voice of the prevailing culture, and their own personal experience, what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had witnessed. But there was more to see, wasn't there? 
There's always more to see. Yes, what we see and, we, and what we hear can sometimes put our faith on shaky ground. But what we hear and what we see and what we experience can also put our faith on solid ground. And there is more to see. It really depends on where you look, who you listen to, doesn't it? I want you to notice what Jesus does with their doubts. I want you to notice how he responds to their fear. He steps in and he lets them see something else. He lets them see a counter narrative to the story that is unfolding all around them, the story that they are probably buying into, the story that is embedded inside them, what they experienced themselves, what they saw. Jesus died. He's dead. He was buried. And now the resurrected Jesus comes along and he says, there's more that you need to see. Don't make your decision based on what you experience and what the world tells you because there's more to experience. There's more to see. He knows they have many reasons not to believe. And he gives them the reason, the biggest reason to believe. Look at, back at the text, verse 39. Look, he says. Don't just look at the world. Don't just look at what's going on around you, the circumstances. Look here. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus let them see his wounds, his nail-scarred hands and his feet. He gave them a reason to believe. And notice he didn't rebuke them for their doubts. He didn't dismiss their doubts. He didn't panic. He simply gave them reassurance. Verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, that's amazing, isn't it? They are touching his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. So they reached out and they touched his hands and they touched his feet, and they still struggled to believe what their eyes were seeing, what their hands were feeling. Why? The text says because of joy and amazement. That's an odd way to say that, isn't it? Because of joy and amazement. This wasn't a stubborn refusal to reject the evidence that was in front of them. This was a response something like, this is too good to be true. We just can't, we just can't go there. This is way too good to be true. Because of joy and amazement. Jesus was standing in front of them. And that was the greatest news. That was the best thing that could happen. But they couldn't believe it. Notice what Jesus did next. He asked for something to eat. That seems kind of odd, doesn't it? Jesus, we're having this deep theological conversation and you want to stop and eat? No, Jesus is doing something here. I don't think Jesus asked for food because he was necessarily hungry. He wanted to demonstrate to them that he was not a figment of their imagination. He was not a ghost. He was not a spirit floating around. He was real. Ghosts don't eat broiled fish. And he ate, and they witnessed him eating. And as he ate, I'm sure their minds were just spinning as they tried to comprehend what was happening. We continue in verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened up their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You have seen these things. He's putting it all together for them. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. With Jesus' assurance comes a calling, a sense of calling. Much like the Old Testament call narratives, when God called a man or a woman to, to lead or to step up or to do something, he often gave them a, a visible sign, a visible signal that he was with them, that he was behind them. And it meant there's work to do. I'm with you. Let's go. 
I think that's some of what Jesus is doing here. He's not just proving himself to them so that they would believe. He is showing that he is real so that they can respond to that truth that he is alive. And if he is alive, that changes everything. And Jesus says there is a message to be preached to the world, a message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. You see, there is work to be done on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb. This is not just a sign showing that Jesus is real. This is a sign that accompanies a calling, a commissioning. I think the same is true for us. I think Jesus meets us in our doubts, not just to prove himself, but to say, let's take care of this so that we can do what we are here to do. And so if you have doubts, if you know someone who has doubts, you're not a bad person. I think that goes without saying, but I think it's important enough for me to say, for you to hear. Because I think sometimes we feel ashamed of our doubts. And here's what happens. We doubt, we have questions, and this happens with young people sometimes, but not just young people. They're not the only ones with doubts. We have doubts, we have questions, but we get pushback, either nonverbal or verbal. We get that panic reaction. We get that, well, you just need to believe, or you just need to, because God said so. And, and what do we do with those questions and doubts? We don't explore. We don't, we don't ask those questions. We just stuff it. We're just supposed to believe. If you have doubts, you're not a bad person. In fact, doubt can be the very pathway to a deeper faith. Asking questions, seeking truth, wrestling with some of those big things in life. Those are good things. I mentioned deconstruction a minute ago. If you read much about theology or much about the church, about trends, you've probably seen that word, deconstruction. But deconstruction isn't all bad. You know, people deconstructing the faith they grew up with, the faith that they were inherited, or that they inherited, or that was given to them, you might say. Deconstructing that faith and then putting something back together. That process in and of itself is not necessarily bad. Because we're, we don't just believe because someone told us to. We don't just believe because, well, I grew up believing. This has to be your faith. And so sometimes we need to ask hard questions. But here's the thing. What are you using to deconstruct your faith? And what are you using to construct what comes after that? Are you using what the world says? Are you using philosophy? Or are you using the word of God? Are you using the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Doubts aren't necessarily bad. They can take us to a good place of stronger faith. But we must not just listen to the narrative of a skeptical world. We need to open our eyes and our ears to what God would have us see, for what God would show us. And sometimes I think it sounds too good to be true, much like with the disciples. Because of the joy and the amazement, they had trouble believing. But see, that's the nature of incomprehensible grace. It is too good to be true, and yet it is true. Someone says, well, if I, can just, if I can just see something visible, if I can just touch something tangible, if, I can, if God would just give me a, an indisputable sign that he is real, or that Jesus is real, or that the Bible is real, if I just, if I just had something, then I would never doubt again. Is that really true? Many people in Jesus' day had that. They had sign after sign, visible, tangible sign after sign, and yet many of them still did not believe. The counter story of their own preconceived ideas and the prevailing voice of the culture were just so strong. They couldn't hear, they couldn't see beyond that narrative to see Jesus. One of Jesus' disciples, of course, Thomas, is remembered as the poster child for doubt. Like the other disciples, he said, I need to see. If seeing is believing, I need to see. I need proof. I need evidence. Thomas was the ultimate skeptic. 
And what did Jesus do? Again, Jesus didn't dismiss his desire to see. He didn't rebuke him. He just met him where he was. And he said, here, see for yourself. Touch my hands. Look at my side. Make up your own mind. And Thomas did. And what did he say? How did he respond? John tells us in his gospel, John chapter 20, verse 28, very simply yet profoundly, my Lord and my God. In other words, you're real. There's no other story I want to believe because this is truth in front of me. My Lord and my God. But the story doesn't end there with Thomas. Jesus says something to Thomas that I don't think is so much for Thomas's sake as it is for our sake. Look at what he says in verse 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's not talking about Thomas there. He's talking about you and me. Blessed are those who haven't touched my nail-scarred hands, who haven't seen me in my resurrected body, and yet they still choose to believe. We choose to believe without seeing, at least without seeing the resurrected body of Jesus. But that doesn't mean there isn't much to see. Remember what Jesus said back in our text in Luke 24? Do you remember what he said when he appeared to them? Peace be with you. And he knew they were afraid. He knew they were confused. He knew they had doubts. And what did Jesus say? Look. That's how it started. Look. Look at my hands. Look. I think there's a lot in that one word. Look. So let me ask you, especially if you're struggling with doubt, what are you looking at? That is a critical question in the process of exploration and of faith formation. What are you looking at? Because the world is giving you a lot to look at. A skeptical world is saying, here's where you need to look. You need to look inside yourself. You need to hear what we have to say. You need to know that truth is relative. You need to know that those stories in the Bible seem fictional. You need to wrestle with why bad things happen in this world and why a good God would let that happen. And those voices begin to stack on top of themselves. And Jesus is saying, hey, look, there's more to see. There's always more to see. Seeing is believing. That may be true. But for people of faith, maybe it's better said a different way. Maybe we just rearrange those words. Maybe it's believing is seeing. When you have questioned and searched and scrutinized and you still have unanswered questions, but you choose to believe, not because you're naive, not because you're unenlightened or not intelligent, you choose to believe. Even with unanswered questions, and after all, isn't that what faith is? If you had the answer to all of your questions, why would you need faith? But you choose to believe. And when you choose to believe, it impacts how you see, how you see the world, how you interpret the world, how you see the circumstances of your own life, how you interpret those circumstances. Paul gives us an example of this truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For the message of the cross... He holds up the cross. He says, think about the cross of Jesus Christ. What does he say about it? It is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Sometimes seeing is believing, and sometimes we need to believe to really see. A skeptical world sees the cross as a foolish symbol, a waste of time. For weak people who need a crutch, who need something to get through life. People who are unenlightened. But the eyes of faith see something different when they view the cross, don't they? They see the power of God. They see heaven clashing with earth in this profound sovereign event that has eternal ramifications. This wonderful act of love 
and grace and mercy that somehow beyond our comprehension removes our sins that separate us from God. That's what the eyes of faith see. You see, the cross can't be both. Truth is not relative. But your perspective is. How you see is. And so the world, Paul says, sees the cross this way. That doesn't make it that way. He says that's how they see it. But the eyes of faith see the cross differently. It is the power of God for the salvation of the world. So this week, let me challenge you. As you interact, as you consume media and social media, as you have conversations with people, maybe fellow Christians, maybe unbelievers, I hope so. I hope you're having conversations with those who don't know Jesus. You're going to hear a lot, and you're going to have a lot of reasons to doubt your faith. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Remember we said faith is often formed in that time of searching and questioning. But let me just ask you this. Amid all the reasons you have to doubt, look for reasons to believe. Open your eyes. The world and its message is going to be loud. And I think Jesus appears sometimes in front of us. As we go throughout our days, he appears and he just says, Hey, look. Look at that. Oh, look at that. What do you see over there? And if we're not looking through the eyes of faith, we don't see anything. We see a coincidence. We see a circumstance. We see something that's unfolding in front of us, but it doesn't mean a lot. Or we see something we can't explain. And maybe that's Jesus saying, Hey, touch my hands. Touch my feet. I'm real. You need to know that I'm real. And so this week, as you think about all the reasons you may have to not believe, look for reasons to believe. We want to be an encouragement to you. If we can do that, let us if we can lift you up in prayer, support you, if we can sit down and open up the scriptures with you, because that's where our answers are found. We'd love to do that. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor right behind me. You can be there in just a minute. They'll encourage you and pray for you, support you, or you can come down to the front and we'll do the same. Maybe you've reached the point in your life where you're ready to give your life to Christ, to confess that he is who he says he is, and that you're ready to surrender your life to him to be baptized into Christ, to live a new life in him. We'd love to help you do that today. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step
Would you bow with me, please? Oh, Lord and God in heaven, we are so grateful that this Sunday morning we have been here, and we pray that our presence here and our actions here have brought glory to your name. And, Father, we know that you are with us always. For that, we pray that each one of us that are here this morning will be assured that we have protection, we have guidance, we have love. And we pray that when we leave this morning, if there are doubts in our lives, we put it on ourselves to seek you and seek others that will help us take those doubts away. For we know that the, the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus has covered us, that we are protected, and it's our own will, willfulness to go against your word that causes us to be separated. And Father, we pray that this morning we will leave here assured that we are saved, and if we're not, that we'll seek you out. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I am grateful for faith, for family, as well as the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, we're excited that you're here today, whether you're visiting with family, whether you're worshiping with us online. It's good to be able to fellowship and to praise God together. Please let us know that you're worshiping with us today. You can go ahead and scan the QR code above me or in our church app. You can let us know that you're here today as well. If it's your first time visiting with us, we have Kevin Rayner outside in the lobby, and he has information about this church family, as well as a gift for you if it's your first time visiting with us. Our deepest sympathies are shared with Judith Risley in the death of her brother, as well as family and friends of Mildred Dunn at her passing as well. Please continue to pray and encourage these families and friends in any ways that you can. Here are some events that are happening in our Edmond community. We have Sunday night singing here in the auditorium at 5 o'clock this evening. And then after that, we have a special performance by our women's chorus that will follow that singing tonight as well. Christmas Wish. Last week we had our stockings go out. This is a, a ministry and a program that allows us to bless families and kids in the area. The next date to be mindful of is December 4th. That's when wrapped gifts are due. We have our men's retreat coming up next weekend, December 2nd and 3rd. The cost is $15 per person, and you can register online or in the foyer. Uh, there's a lot of energy about this coming weekend, just different speakers trying to connect through ge different generations of men, as well as great food and talks about Jesus. I believe there will be some kind of barbecue meat item, which should be better than the McRib, so uh, we're excited about that. We have the Breakfast with Santa coming up on December 10th. You can register for that online through uh, December 7th, and registration is required for you to be part of that event. And so if you want Breakfast with Santa, make sure that you sign up by December 7th. We are mindful of our Angel Park Community Project. Uh, we encourage you to be prayerful and mindful of what this may mean for not only the Edmond community, we're not looking to self-glorify or just add on to our building and our structures here, but to really bless the community at large. We have a date of December 11th to uh, pledge for that and to pray over our giving, so uh, just be mindful of that and praying over what your family can provide for that project coming up. Uh, I'm really encouraged today, I hope you are too, just to be mindful that we are not called to perfection, uh, perfection in action or beliefs. We have doubts. This is a journey that we're all on, but you are not alone. We do this together. And so um, I hope you're encouraged in that as I remind you that you are sent.